Welcome to the Taoist Arts International Expert Series. I'm Robert Coons. With me today is Jack Schaefer of Parting Clouds Taoist Studies. Welcome to the show, Jack. Hey, Robbie. Thanks for having me. This is exciting. I'm loving well, your endeavor. <laughs> nice to have you again. And uh, we don't know whether this will be the first one or the second one, but we did one interview as well before. Um, but today we're going to talk about uh, Taoism. So you are a uh, Chuanzhen Longmen Taoist priest um, from uh, Qingcheng Shan in uh, what is in Sichuan province, right? Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the basics of that? And then maybe we can go a little bit deeper. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, I mean, like you said, um, I have a, an ordination as a priest through uh, the Jianfu Gong in Qingcheng. And you know, it's it's one of a few ordinations that I actually hold. That's the most well known one. But um, my partner and I, who actually run Parting Clouds with Josh Painter, we actually have a few ordinations. We have a, an ordination from a a uh, Chuanzhen Longmen. Um, it's considered a Wudong sect, but it's not the martial arts sect. It's closer related to Lu Shan in uh, in um, Zhejiang Province. So we have a, an ordination with a, an exorcistic teacher there. We also have an ordination with another teacher. Um, and then he's more of like the um, fire school. And then we also have a, a Maoshan ordination as well. So, you know, the, the, our, both Josh and I, our approach to studying Taoism is that, you know, in the West, there's, there's not a lot of, of depth in what's being taught. And so, we have made it a point to find several very knowledgeable teachers and spend time with them. And through the process of spending time with them, some of that actually requires ordination to get inside the door to learn other things from them as well. Yeah. Great. What's a fire school? <laughs> That's you, you've probably seen that more in the, in like the Chinese medicine, you know, uh, Chinese medicine, like I know Heiner, Heiner really teaches a lot of that, those like using lots of foods, uh, but they also have a, a whole Confucian Taoist lineage to it. And so our, our teacher, he's, he's a Chuanzhen Longmen as well. As you know, like a lot of these guys in China, they'll, they'll be officially ordained into one of these lineages like Zheng Yi or Longmen or something, but then their real thing is something else. And so he's he's part of that fire school. So that's that's his whole medicine style. It it gets into some of how he teaches Taoism too. It's it's very um, uh, precept focused and you know behavior focused and a lot of stillness meditation that kind of thing. Cool. Well, that's really exciting. There's so there's a lot of breadth and depth that we could talk about today. But um, one of the things that I think everybody would like to hear is what the heck is Taoism? And we've we've asked a few people this now, but um, you're 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 next. So let's let's hear your take. This is a crazy question, and I feel like it's a really loaded question, Robbie, because I think Sorry. you know um, there's a lot of ways to look at this. I think we can look at it from a, a scholarly point of view. You know, we can look at it um, from a personal point of view. I can, I'll, I'll just say this, you know, Taoism really now is a religion. And it's a religion that's been practiced since the Han Dynasty in various forms as a growing, alive tradition. And so we don't in any way practice what we did or what our for our ancestors did in the Han Dynasty by any means, but we can definitely see the genetics of that in modern Chuanzhen Long, you know. But so I see Taoism as as a religion. Now, what is this religion focused on? Is is that's the thing? That's the crux, right? So the crux then you'd say is this religion is focused on Tao, and then what is Tao, right? What does it mean to be focused on Tao? You know, and everybody. If you go online, you'll always see people saying, well, yeah, that's that thing that can't be talked about. They, you know, they always go down this path, but I'll tell you, I think that's a, that's a, a cheap answer, you know, because you, as, as you've seen, the Taoist canon is massive. 
So there is a lot written about what is the Tao, how to study the Tao, how to be a Taoist, you know? And so I think one of the things we can, we can boil it down to is what, is what does it mean to maybe follow the Tao? So if we can't really name it, we can't really describe it because it's some sort of emptiness that has a creative ability to it. We do know a couple of things about it, you know? I love, you know, Livia, Livia Cohen has a great description of, of Taoism or of the Tao, and she, she calls it cosmic goodness. And I think that's actually a really cool way to think about this. So the Tao is this cosmic goodness, this, it's not really a noun, it's not really a verb, but it's something. And so you could say that Taoism as a religion then is somehow creating a system where we follow cosmic goodness, or we try and cultivate cosmic goodness, <laughs> you know? Um, so what that would mean then is, is how do we do that as a person, you know, behaviorally, ritually, scripturally, you know, and then the, so there's all that side of it. And then the next side of it is, you know, Taoism as a religion is a lot around some, somehow, some way you returning to or unifying with that cosmic goodness, you know? So that's where we see things like, you know, um, the advent of Nadan, for example, you know, as, as, a, as a, some sort of method to drive people out of, off of the wheel of, of reincarnation, off the wheel of samsara, and allow them to reunify with that cosmic goodness or the Tao. And so all of, you could, you could really boil it down to, it's a religion based on that. Now, the cool part about this then is that while you may never in this lifetime become a realized human being who unifies with the Tao and unifies with that cosmic goodness, to use Livia's term again, um, you're going to be a really good person. Because in order to do that, you have to mimic it. And so you have to act like a good person. You know, there's that, you, you, you've seen those bracelets that Christians used to wear for a while that said, what would Jesus do? But, you know, we, we have that in, in Taoism too. It's like, how, what would the Tao do in a certain situation? What is the essence of cosmic goodness in, in behaving with our fellow humans, you know, behaving with our families, ourselves, treating how we treat the world? And so at the very end, what you end up becoming is a, a kind person who is beneficial to society, you know? So that's, that's my long and short of it today. Ask me again tomorrow, I might give you a slightly different answer. Yeah, well, that's how things are, right? They're, they're variable and they keep changing and transforming. But um, so this is a very good answer. Now, here's another question for you that I think it's maybe a little bit um, selfish. But my, my question is, there are a lot of different um, approaches to practicing something that resembles the Tao, even, even in China. Um, or maybe we can say it is the Tao. And so the two that I can think of that are like the most, that have been the most popular historically, or maybe three, uh, Taoism, Confucianism, or Neo-Confucianism, uh, Neo and Buddhism. And I'm just wondering, because some of them are very similar, like Neo-Confucianism is very, very similar to Taoism in a lot of ways. I'm wondering um, what you see as being the principal difference between these uh, let's say these systems of thought that sometimes are religions and sometimes behave philosophically and sometimes behave as practices. Um, and do you think that they are actually very different or do you think that there are certain essential differences between them that are worth talking about? Oh, that's a, that's a cool question. You know, and I think, again, it's a, it's a really broad question. You know, I think, I think um, if we look at like, Taoism, Confucianism, and, and Neo-Confucianism, you know, there's the dichotomy between Confucianism and Neo-Confucianism is really interesting in that Neo-Confucianism brings in a lot of Taoist and, and Buddhist sort of ideals related to cosmology, right? So, so the Neo-Confucians then got a cosmologic, a cosmologic reasoning for the things that Confucius and all of his followers would preach, you know? So I think ultimately there's, there are lots of, lots of similarities, you know, even as, as Chanjin Taoists, we say, you know, we're the unification of the three, right? Buddhism, Taoism, and, and Confucianism. So for us, 
we don't really actually see them as, as being separate from each other. It would be really impossible to pull them in a vacuum. There is no Taoism, you know, no Taoism without Buddhism. You know, that the Buddhism has had an influence on Taoism for 2000 plus years and Taoism on Buddhism. And the Confucius and the Dao, Confucians and the Taoists, you know, they, they were always communicating. They were always related. And, and most of the times they were practicing both because to be Confucian, you were really, at least pre-Neo-Confucian, you were a lot about society. Once you were Neo-Confucian, you were about society plus cosmology plus cultivation, you know? So I think if we look at maybe to frame it down to like what separates Neo-Confucians from, from Taoists of the same era, it might just be the idea of deity, you know, the idea of, of a lot of those practices in cosmologies and stuff find their way into the use of deities, but ultimately those deities being being a representative of aspects of you as a human. So they could easily be ignored and still be talking about the same thing. I think the other piece though that that Taoists bring into it that maybe the, the Neo-Confucians didn't is certain aspects of, of ritual medicine, you know? So using, using ritual as a healing form, I don't, I don't think they would use things like talismanic medicine and whatnot as, as in, in Confucian medicine, you know? You know, the big Confucian medicine classic, I can't remember the name of it in Chinese, but it means basically um, how to treat your father mm. with, with, Ru, with Ru, with Confucianism. Interesting. Which is a very, very interesting idea. Um, so this is this is good. This is a good working definition because I think sometimes um, in in Western countries we can get a little bit um, confused about where the boundaries are between things, and we often end up with this very strange take that people have that um, Confucius was a pretty sour guy um, who didn't like drinking vinegar, and that uh, and that Lao Tzu he liked to drink vinegar, and therefore he was good. Um, but, uh, you know, my, my sense personally is that they're really, really deeply intertwined. And so I wanted to ask that question particularly because, uh, Chuan Chen combines those three teachings, Taoism, Buddhism, and Confucianism. Um, but then beyond that, so I want to start working forward a little bit in history. So the current iteration of, of Chuan Chen Taoism or Longman, Dragon Gate Taoism, um, it comes from... Uh, originally from Wang Chongyang, right? But then there's a more recent figure who really uh, advanced the school and reformed it. So how did Kunyang uh, help to form modern Longman Taoism? And what does that mean to your practice as a Taoist? Yeah, I mean, Kunyang is a really interesting character. And, you know, my knowledge of him is as a person and all of his his aspects are is definitely not what it could be but i can say for me personally the things that i think kunyang really brings to taoism that i feel are really important at least at this day and age are twofold one is that he brought in public ordination so he he really he brought in this idea that that you could make ordination into being uh, an, a Taoist priest, which really just means a serious practitioner, um, somebody who's who's promised to follow the way they've converted, you know. So he brought that in, and he made it easier to to spread because, you know, they weren't necessarily a proselytizing religion back then. You know, I mean, there there have definitely been moments in history where Taoists were, but it, in his time, it wasn't really what they did, but he did open it up so that more people could could join. And so he ordained so many people at that point. So that's one thing I think that is really important. For him. The other thing that he he brings in that I think is is an emphasis on precepts. He really, really puts a lot of emphasis in that. And, you know, I don't know, you could argue that that's always been there. Because when we look back to the celestial masters, we see that, and we see that as part of the Taiping, and you know, on and it's always been a part of of religious Taoism, you know. But he puts a big emphasis on that as as precept as an as an act of cultivation. 
So what that really boils down to then is, is your behavior in and of itself becomes a type of cultivation, becomes a type of way of, of changing you towards that ultimate realization. You know, I mean, there's been a lot written about Kunyan, but I think those are two of the things that really, really jump out to me in his contribution. And then after after Kunyang, of course, Longmen um, developed in a lot of parts of China and ultimately even went out of um, what we would normally consider as mainland China too. And so now there's a lot of different schools of Longmen Taoism at different mountains. And um, you guys are associated with a, with a couple of them. But I'm wondering, you know, again, um, these are the times that I get to ask you the questions that I'm really interested in. And I'm sure if I'm interested in them, the audience is also interested in them. Um, what are the different, so this is one thing that I heard recently. I heard that some of the schools are really quite different from each other. And I'm wondering in your experience, what's the major sort of similarity and difference between schools of Chuanzhen Longmen? Oh man, I I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that question because I really feel like that's a that's an academic anthropologic question, you know? But I, I, I can just, from my own experience, um, I can say that I, I, I don't know if I would put this on the mountains per se, like, you know, each mountain has a different focus or whatnot. They probably do. And, but I really think that actually has a lot more to do with the teachers because through, you know, through all the times that, that we've been in China and all of the, the teachers that we've met, some we continue to study with and some we've met and, have no yuan fan with, you know? Um, I, think, I think different teachers have different strengths, weaknesses, and interests. And that probably shapes the culture of that temple or maybe even that mountain if they're a high enough ranking priest or something, you know? Um, like our, our teacher at Ching Chung, you know, she's, she's very focused on sort of the, um, stillness and emptiness and stillness meditation and the performance of the liturgy that's her thing you know um while our our teacher in in Zhejiang is everything he does is is either meditation based or um ritual based around Taoist medicine so he spends large parts of his days doing talismans and things like that and you know, our uh, our uh, one of our other teachers spends all of his time almost alone near one of Go Home's caves. He has like one student, you know, ever hanging out with him, you know, and he just spends a lot of time just meditating and doing and doing various forms of like you know qigong and stuff. So I don't I don't know. I mean I I I'm sure that the different mountains. I mean some of it's obvious. Like Wudong has its kung fu thing you know but beyond that I, I i wouldn't really say i think i think i would be speaking out of school yeah well that seems fair too and one of the things that occurred to me suddenly while you were talking about that was that there's this wonderful way that Taoists communicate with each other which is that they wander around from temple to temple and mountain to mountain and they learn from one another which is called uh union or cloud walking and so it sounds it sounds to me like maybe you even get people from different temples showing up in a place and they're they're facilitating this whole project uh, pro, um you know process by which um people get exposed to a lot of different things i don't know if that's true or not yeah just making it up as i go along no no i think i think it is true and i think it, you know people will spend time on some mountains and then whether they're officially reassigned because they're a high enough ranking person that they need to spend time at another temple or they connect with another teacher you know, and then they move. I think there's a lot of that. And I think that's how things will get spread for sure. Now, this is where another interesting question about distinctions comes up, because there's also, um, you're also a part of a, a Maoshan lineage. And I believe Maoshan is really, in a lot of ways, fundamentally different from, from Chuanzhen. Is that, is that sort of correctish? Or what do you, what do you think the distinction between those schools is? Well, okay, so what I can talk about with that lineage, I'll talk about. Um, definitely. 
you know, so in our in our Loman lineage, we spend a lot of time really focused on doctrine. You know, so so teasing apart scriptural texts, and we, you know, I like to think that every question that you have about life can be answered somehow in the scriptures. You can dig through there and find an answer. You know, and so Loman is a lot about just doctrine, scripture, precepts, meditation. Like those, I think, are some of the main aspects to it, you know, um, being a good person, being a kind person, helping other people, working towards the salvation of other people. My experience with, with Mao Shan, I, I have yet to actually have a liturgical conversation with our teacher. You know, it's everything is really based on, on there's a lot of cultivations and rituals. And it, I think, I think it's a it's a wonderful lineage. I think it'd be really hard to to follow if we hadn't done Chanjen Longmen for a long time, because there's a lot of things taken for granted in the learning of it. And I also feel like the amount of memorization in you know because you're memorizing long incantations and long talismans and things, it's really very difficult for I think non Chinese speaking individuals to to learn you know so so I, I would say that that's a big difference in the two i think they 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 paid heed to all the doctrinal stuff but our teacher does not spend much time focusing on it he's more of a like a fashu you know he's he's all he's doing things for people you know so his his way of working with the Tao is in action you know yeah, well, this is a, this you you mentioned a really important point, which is that there are certain elements of Taoism which are very very hard to access. If you not only do you have to be able to speak and and read Chinese, but you have to have contextual cultural knowledge about China and even about the basics of Taoism to be able to even get your foot in the door of a lot of different elements of Taoism, especially when they start to get esoteric. And one of the things that um, I've noticed in the community, broadly speaking, is that um, for many Western students, um, and you know, this is not—I'm not trying to be uh, condescending or anything like that—but there's a habit of, I should say, for many of the teachers, there's a habit to sort of simplify Taoism into uh, practice or a series of practices or um, you know, a necessarily consistent philosophical worldview. Rather than really going into the core of of you know Taoist ideas, so that we can be more conservative, um, you know, conversant about them, and one of the distinctions, this is my question, one of the distinctions that is really important in um, the religious Taoist schools is the difference between um, between Tao and Fa. Right, so you have Tao, uh, this you know concept of the Tao, and then Fa, which maybe I'll call it method for the moment. And I'm wondering um, if you can elucidate a little bit on this idea of Tao and Fa, and why it would be worth people knowing about when they want to approach Taoist as a, as a, or Taoism as a study. Yeah, I think this is a really cool question. It's something I think about a lot, um, just in my own personal life. You know, because just just to give you some context to this, you know, so so for me as a, an American, you know, Taoist priest who, you know, lives in this culture and with, I've got a family and I run a medical clinic, you know, and I, but, and I also co-run, you know, Parting Clouds. And so, you know, I've got all of these things that I do. And I think about it a lot because in order to, to live in my life, I have to to engage in both of these. You know, one aspect of my life is the fa, you know, the fa shu, right? So, so when I, you know, the the priest side of me will will spend time teaching classes with our organization. So we're delivering doctrine, we're delivering content and material, and and we're also delivering methods. And I also spend part of my time doing Taoist medicine for people. So writing talismans and doing rituals and, and all of this, fa, right? But in the end, like if there is no Tao or if there is no understanding and connection to and study of doctrine, I don't think that those things have any power. I think they end up being like empty form, 
you know, like you can see these Dallas TikTokers, you know, who are, they're, just, they're, they're on there and they're doing all kinds of stuff, but you really don't know how much cultivation they actually have. And so, you know, I think about it a little bit like the FA is like the all aspects of the car except the engine. And the Dow is really the engine. It's the thing that makes the car actually work. And it makes it actually move. And so, you know, when I, I think about this a lot with teaching students, you know, if, they, if we're teaching them a, a method, say a cultivation method or a, a ritual practice, and it's not working, that's not the practice's fault, right? The, the practice has been passed down forever. You know, the, the Chinese historically have been incredibly pragmatic people. So they wouldn't keep a practice that's hollow. So it's always reliant on you. And for us as Taoists, the, the missing part then is our engagement of Tao, you know? So in our, our I'm gonna use the word cultivation, but cultivation in this way means more than just meditation. I mean, you know, stillness and clarity meditation is important, but also you get, your engine tuned up by also engaging in behavioral practices like precepts and stuff, or um, a few, you know, a few of the other things that we do, but those things are really important. And so if we don't spend time on Tao, then our fa is really empty. And so I think that ends up being a problem for a lot of Western practitioners because, you know, you go, if you don't speak Chinese, you don't read Chinese, you go to China, you spend a, a, you know, a week or two there with some teacher getting some base translations. They get frustrated trying to teach you. So maybe what they do is they end up, they end up just showing you some methods, some, some Qigong. They describe this, maybe some sort of stillness meditation where you're visualizing some things or because it's easier to teach and you, you get something from it because it's really hard to talk about doctrine in that. You know, it's really hard to talk about the nuts and bolts and, and the depth of practices or the depth of understanding the Tao that way. And so, you know, that maybe is what they got exposed to. Or maybe they were, you know, working with some less than scrupulous teachers. I don't know, you know. And then as a teacher over here, you get yourself in a situation. It's a, you, you know, this as a martial arts teacher and a Qigong teacher, that stuff is so easy to teach, you know, because you're just explaining mechanical things. It's so, you know, visualizing purple and blue lights and all that kind of stuff is also really easy to teach. And so if you're uncertain, unqualified, or lack, you know, even lack, lacking confidence, those are easy things to teach or those methods. The unfortunate thing is they end up being hollow and they don't always, they don't always produce the result people want, you know? I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, that's a great answer. You know, f at least from my perspective, um, I always worry that students will maybe come from another school of thought and they want to learn something real. They get the sense that Taoism has, has something good. But then when they go to learn, they don't learn the the main thing, which is that you have to integrate actually with nature uh, as a uh, something that is time and space. You have to become that in order to really manifest these things. And at the end of the day, if you're using a method, the method is actually helping you to integrate with that. Um, you know, maybe the methods that I'm familiar with are a little bit more uh, internal rather than being so much uh, related to community stuff. But I think at the end, we would agree about this this one very important thing, which is that you have to actually connect to the Tao to be able to manifests these things otherwise they're really really hollow and it's uh it's it's just nasal gazing to make a pun uh nasal gazing navel gazing yeah. i don't know maybe you can do both or both or both <laughs> you know um but but if you don't have the dao it's very empty navel gazing um not that you know and that's another thing that i think is a another question that just came to mind right now because i might be accused of of being uh you know, unreasonable or, or arrogant because of that statement. So let, let me walk it back a bit. When we talk about having the Tao, we don't mean that you have immediately become an ascended being, right? So I wonder if you can tell me a little bit, because again, this is another problem we have, is that some people are presenting these very clear curriculums that will take you all the way from being a schmo 
to being an ascended being. And you just have to follow the right steps according to a very pragmatic list of, you know, meditations. And I'm wondering if you can tell us about from the perspective of, of uh, any of the Taoist schools that you're involved with, whether or not that's accurate or whether there's whether it's a different way, or even if the idea of ascension is somehow misunderstood by a lot of these schools. Yeah, um, man, that's a good question. So, you know, I can't really comment on what other people think, you know, like what they think ascension is or, but I, I do, I do feel like, you know, the, there is, there is somewhat of a process, you know, but I don't, I don't think, I think it's really individualized. And I actually feel like this individualization of how we get there um, has, is part of what's led to a lot of trouble in the West because people think of, of Taoism in the West and we face this all the time, you know, in teaching is that we in some ways have to undo some of the preconceived notions that people will come with about what things are and what, you know, go with the flow means and all that kind of stuff. You know, my Tao, my Tao is this and my Tao is that. And, and we have to actually like undo all that and untangle it first before we can even get into the process. But, you know, I think there are, um, there are tools that are used in Taoism to help one become a realized person. And I think that those tools, our use of them ebbs and flows as we're a person, you know? So if, if I were a single guy who had a trust fund, um, I could spend a lot of time in, in like meditative states. I could spend hours and hours, maybe even go on several month retreats and all that kind of stuff. But you know, that, that's one tool is these, these deep, intense, you know, cycles of, of meditation. But they're like the tool, like we talked about earlier, the tool of precepts. You know, precept is a way of behaving, right? And why do we need these, these ways of behaving? You know, the, the, the idea of, of, of modified, constructed behaviors isn't because like a 10 commandments sort of thing where these are the rules we're not actually doing that we're doing these things because they're the they're the way the Tao, which i mentioned earlier using livia's definition is cosmic goodness they're the way the Tao would actually choose to to be in a certain situation right that that sort of goodness and so by um acting as if we were then it puts us more in alignment with the Tao and that becomes a cultivation. And so as a person who runs a busy medical clinic and I have a family and, and we, have all the, we have all these students and parting clouds and then one of the things I have to do is I have to interact. And so I need to make choices in how I interact. I can interact like an ass, you know, but that would be like me interacting based on my emotional states in some of my baser human instincts, which aren't necessarily, you know, in alignment with the Tao, right? Or I can choose to act in alignment with the Tao as much as humanly possible. So that turns into a cultivation, you know, so there, th those are just two examples. And so I think what we, what we end up doing is we end up ebbing and flowing in those things. I think that the steps that you mentioned earlier, like people will say, well, there's this step and then you do this and then you do this. I do think that there is some of that because, you know, you do have to know what you're doing. So for example, you know, you have to spend a certain amount of time understanding where you came from, where this religion came from, how it developed, why it went through the changes it did, because it's a living religion. You know, if, if you look at your body and you're like, man, why do I have this problem? I, I'm, I can look to my parents and see if my parents, what kind of issues they had too. You know, it's, it's important for us to, to know the d DNA of the religion. And then we can see that there are certain things that we have to learn along the way, because I can't, I it, like this idea of, of preceptual practice, you know, if I don't understand that being, like I just said, being a good person 
is what puts me in alignment with the Tao. And that actually puts me closer to realization. If I just think it's, it's just somebody giving me some sort of, of 10 commandments type of thing, then I'm going to resist it because I don't know the why. So we, we need to learn certain whys and those whys are contained in doctrinal study. So my personal view is that we have to go through things like a, some historical analysis, some doctrinal study, that helps us start to, to tease apart some of the, the threads of what makes Taoism Taoism. And then we can see why the practices relate to that. And then we fit that into our personal life, you know? So, because being a Taoist isn't something I just do on the cushion. Like I don't just sit on the cushion. I'm a Taoist while I'm doing my stillness and clarity meditation. And then I'll go, you know, drive in traffic like an ass, get, you know, go to the clubs all weekend and just get trashed. This is my, this is my Tao, you know, yell at people as freely as I want to. I mean, that stuff is all out of alignment with the Tao. I have to be Taoist 24 seven. And so in order to do that, then I have to understand all of the whys. And if I understand all of the whys, actually being Taoist 24 seven is much easier because then, then there's not a, um, there's not a contention with it because I know why I'm, needing to, to do what I want to, these things I need to do, and I actually start wanting to do them, not just feeling like it's forced upon me, you know. I don't know if that answers your question, Robbie. Marvelous. <laughs> yeah, extraordinary. Um, so th that's very cool. And this is one of the things that um, I, I personally think people ought to watch out for, is that whether you follow precepts or whether you... Um, you know, you're maybe you're, you're more secular or more relaxed, but you, you'd like to try to understand how to live better by using the Tao. Uh, you need to be looking at those aspects of your life that are out of harmony and trying to bring them back into harmony. And I think that we all find out, well, hopefully at some point that, uh, you know, big greasy hamburgers, hot peppers, getting angry, smoking cigarettes, um, not uh, being not being generous to other people, even if just in our minds, um, and uh, you know, living in the fast lane are all things that wear you down over time. And uh, instead, slowing down, taking care of yourself, taking care of others, uh, being able to feel love in a way that's not possessive, all of these things are, uh, are, are good for you. And so I think one of the things that Taoism gives us uh, is the ability to do that and for Westerners in a way that takes us out of our own cultural context a little bit, because the 10 commandments are pretty cool, but the problem is sometimes when you get beaten over the head with them for 2000 years, they start to, they start to lose their meaning. Right. So yeah, I would add to this though. Yeah. I would say that also all those things you just mentioned don't lead us anywhere, but I would also say sitting alone by a Creek all the time, sitting in a cave or a monastery all alone, and just meditating and being by myself is also not not the way either. Sometimes it's it's social. Yeah, it's it's romantic. But you know, I think one of the fastest cultivations you can have is 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 being in society, you know. Yeah, I can't, I can't stand retreats. <laughs> I tried well, to go know, on a retreat once, it didn't yeah. work. I'm the nicest person in the world when I'm alone. <laughs> you know? like, nobody can argue that who am i who am i going to be mean to you know yeah but, you could always be mean to the stream <laughs> but I, I do think we need to we need to to you know the cultivation is in action a lot it's in in being engaged you know yeah yeah exactly okay well uh i've i've learned significantly more about uh Taoism today so i'd like to start wrapping it down but we have two questions that we ask at the end the first question is um where do you see this going in 10 years see what see parting clouds see me see yeah where where do you see chuan jen long Taoism going in 10 years oh man i have high hopes for it i really do you know um i think this 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 religion is amazing and i think that it has so much that it can offer to people and so you know, in 10 years, I actually would really like to see a community of Western Taoists who are who have a real authentic, deep understanding of Taoism 
no more of this like Victorian era um, Jesuit translated, you know, Taoism, but you know, no more, do all due respect, no more Alan Watts Taoism, you know, but some, some real authentic, serious practitioners who, you know, are, are capably teaching, you know, Chuan Zhen Long Men in the West. That actually, that's, that's something I would love to, to see, you know, and, and um, that's one of our, our main goals at Parting Clouds is, is really just producing a community of people who just are, are solid in their understanding and, and their abilities. Whether they become teachers or not, I don't really care. But that's, that's what I, that's my dream for it. Where do I see it? I'm not going to fortune tell. But <laughs> if I have anything to say about it, that's what it's going to be. I love it. That sounds perfect. Um, I, I support you guys all the way. So now we have barely mentioned parting clouds. So before we finish, can you please tell us what you do uh, in Taoism, um, why it's why it's valuable, and how people can get in contact with you? Sure. You know, so so um, parting clouds Taoist education is an organization that's run by Josh Painter and myself, and Honestly, it's it started as a it started as a walk in the mountains in Qingchang. So the two of us were on a walk talking about our histories in in study, how we ended up in this spot, and all of the things that we wished had been available to us when we were younger, you know? And Parting Clouds was just kind of born from that. Our teachers started being really supportive of the idea. They gave, they recognized Parting Clouds as a, as a temple organization here in the United States. They've made us both abbots, whatever that means, you know. Um, so what we ended up doing in this was, we started this about, I don't know, a two, year or two before COVID, something like that, is, is teaching and bringing students together. And, you know, Josh lives in New York, I live in Colorado. And so we started doing a lot of things via Zoom. And then COVID really made that much more unacceptable to people. So what we do then is we, we run online classes um, every week. We meet live and we have, we have everything from beginners to really advanced Taoist medicine students. So we spend the majority of every Tuesday on the online teaching and then we run yearly retreats. So we used to take people to China. We'd take them to our temples and and work with our teachers and whatnot. And um, in the last couple of years, because of COVID, obviously nobody was going to China. But we we have friends who run other temples here in the United States that are part of the Chinese diaspora community. And so we did a, a retreat, for example, last fall in New York, and we did an ordination for a bunch of our students at one of the temples there. And, so parting clouds, you know, our, our mission is really to just do what I had mentioned in my statement a minute ago, is to try and create a community of, of well-taught, well-understood, educated, practicing, serious Taoists in the West. And that's worked out pretty well. We have students in the United States, Canada, the Caribbean, Mexico, Australia, Germany, France, Ireland, Russia, um, I'm sure I'm missing some something, but there people are, we have people all over the world that are part of our organization. And, um, you know, we're pretty open to, you know, to people coming and working with us. The, what we do is we, we don't do a rolling enrollment. We only take students a couple times a year through an application process. Um, and uh, it, you know, if people like what we do and we like them, they stay. And if we're not for them, we're happy to stay friends and let them go. <laughs> you know, but that's that's it in a nutshell. Yeah, fantastic. And we'll link to um, your website and your and your social uh, in the in the video section. So um, anyone who's watching the video. Look at the comments and you will be able to find uh parting clouds and uh and and jack so thank you very much everybody jack please stick around for just a second 
Um, this has been the Dawi podcast uh, expert series, and uh, we'll see you in the next video. Thanks for having me.